Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Chris. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to them uh, for inviting me to this conference. It's, of course, always a pleasure to talk about the study of argumentation, but it's even a greater <laughs> pleasure when I can talk about the study of argumentation to critical discourse analysts, because I firmly believe that critical discourse analysis and the study of argumentation belong together. It's a truism that argumentation always arises in response to or in anticipation of a difference of opinion. When people argue their case, they are defending an opinion or standpoint that they assume not to be shared by the ROC or by some third party the ROC might associate with. The need for argumentation the requirements of justification and the structure of argumentation are all adapted to a context in which doubts, opposition, objections and counterclaims arise. Argumentation is aimed at resolving a difference of opinion about the acceptability of a standpoint by making an appeal to the other party's reasonableness. The standpoint at issue in the difference of opinion can pertain to any kind of subject, and these standpoints can be descriptive as well as evaluative or practical. An evaluative judgment like the film Infamous is brilliant, or a practical incitation to do something like you should join me to that meeting, can be just as well an issue in argumentative discourse as a descriptive claim about a factual state of affairs, like Amsterdam is much smaller than Brussels. Standpoints of any of these types and the argumentation to defend them can be encountered in all spheres of life, from the family circle and the classroom to the law and the political arena. Philosophers with a neo-positivist or similar mindset have a party pre that normative statements such as evaluative and inciting practical standpoints can never be the object of a reasonable discussion so that value judgments and choices for action can only be based on subjective preference and personal interests. Among the philosophers who do not agree with this, what I would call, exclusionist outlook, is John Stuart Mill, who showed a keen interest in ethical, political and religious standpoints and believed that, except for mathematics, as he said, all subjects can be the object of a reasonable discussion. I emphatically agree with Mill that there is no justification for pronouncing all positions implying a value hierarchy or action principle a priori unsuitable for a reasonable discussion. My what you could call inclusionist argument, by the way, fits in with a long-standing analytic tradition that distinguishes besides the reasonableness that scientists adhere to when dealing with physical reality, reasonableness bearing on value judgments and reasonableness relating to the desirability of actions. It's not only unnecessary to limit the scope of the notion of reasonableness to descriptive standpoints, but also highly undesirable, because in certain spheres of life this would give free reign to those who are not interested in maintaining reasonableness. In politics, for instance, it would provide them with an, an, an alibi for abstaining from giving argumentation to justify their actions, and it would offer them a chance to immunize their standpoints, that is, making them immune for criticism by proclaiming them beyond discussion. Let me elaborate some more on the case of politics, because this is clearly an area that should not be excluded from argumentative reasonableness. Leaving matters of institutional organization aside, participation in democracy amounts first and foremost to an engagement of the members of the community or society at large in a continual and public discourse about common interests, policies to be developed and decisions to be taken. Taking into account that preferences may change as a result of communication, Schumpeter, one of the most influential modern theoreticians of democracy, calls the will of the people in capitalism 
socialism and democracy, quote, the product, not the motive power of the political process. In a great many so-called representative democracies, however, the outcomes of the political process are predominantly the product of negotiations between political leaders rather than the result of a universal process of deliberation. More often than not, allegedly political discussions are in fact no more than the one-way traffic of leaders talking down to their voters. And it's only when elections are closed that politicians adjust their campaign, sometimes in a blatantly opportunistic way, to the opinions of their voters, albeit that this adjustment is by no means the result of an elaborate and intensive discussion of potential issues. At this juncture, it's necessary to make a distinction between the phenomenon of discussion as a regulated critical dialogue aimed at resolving a difference of opinion as we want to have it, and quasi-discussion that is in fact a monologue calculated to win the audience's consent with one's own views. In the latter case, the discourse is merely rhetorical in the narrowest sense. The discourse may only be called critical in the dialectical sense if discussion does not simply mean unidirectional persuading, but refers to a methodical argumentative exchange governed by the purpose of working out together what is just or acceptable. In a critical discussion, the protagonist of a standpoint and the antagonist try to establish whether the protagonist's standpoint is capable of withstanding the antagonist's criticism. In my opinion, ideally, democracy should always involve aiming at the promotion of such a critical discussion. Only if this is the case, participation in political discussion or political discourse can really contribute to enhancing the quality of democracy. Seeing argumentation as occurring within a discourse that is to be regarded as aiming to be a critical discussion means viewing the arguments that are put forward dialectically. Argumentation is then considered to be part of a regimented procedure for testing the standpoint at issue against critical reactions. Let us think of this dialectical discussion procedure as being something like a code of conduct for rational discussions that aim to achieve their argumentative goals in a reasonable way. In the context of politics, such a code of conduct indicates how, in a specific institutionalized setting, justice can be done to the fact that democracy is quintessentially institutionalized uncertainty. In my opinion, the dialectical rules for argumentative discourse that make up the code of conduct for rational discussions who aim to achieve their argumentative goals in a reasonable way are therefore of crucial importance to giving substance to the ideal of participatory democracy. In politics, as well as other real-life contexts, we have to take into account that actual human interaction is not always naturally and automatically oriented towards dialectical reasonableness. In the political context, for instance, those who are involved in a disagreement do not generally enter into discussion willing to subject their thinking to critical scrutiny, and they are often heavily vested in the one outcome or the other. The social conditions in which they argue typically involve some degree of inequality of power and resources. And on top of that, the discussions may well have different levels of critical skill. The same circumstances that give rise to argument may also create practical demands for immediate settlement and therefore place constraints on the possibilities for truly resolving the disagreement. Actual argumentative practices in politics and elsewhere are shaped by such constraints. And because of this, in certain institutions, specific forms of deliberation have been established to overcome these constraints. Like mediation for sorting out disagreement, the contestants themselves cannot cope with, with if left entirely by themselves. And specific argumentative activity types have been developed to compensate for the constraints by seeing to a deliberately controlled exchange, like the hearings that are held in legal context and in Parliament. In view of these argumentative predicaments, one might ask whether maintaining the dialectical ideal of critical discussion in dealing with argumentation in political and other real-life contexts is not utopian. It might seem like that, 
on first thoughts. But on second thoughts is not. The ideal of critical discussion is by definition not a description of any kind of reality, but constitutes a model that represents a theoretical standard and can be used for heuristic, analytic and evaluative purposes. <coughs> the model gives substance to what it means to be critical in dealing with argumentative discourse and is an instrument for doing justice to the vital intellectual, social and cultural interests that may be at stake in argumentative practice because argumentative discussion of standpoints plays or should play a crucial part in virtually every joint decision making, not only in education, law, politics and other domains of public life, but also in the private sphere, the quality of the discussion is to be tested critically in all cases, and systematic efforts must be made to secure optimal quality. Scholars of argumentation are often drawn to studying argumentation by a practical interest in improving the quality of argumentation or the quality of argumentative discourse where this is due. They typically combine an empirical orientation with a critical orientation towards argumentative discourse. In order to give substance to this combination, in the study of argumentation, a comprehensive research program must be carried out that ensures that argumentative discourse is not only examined empirically as a specimen of verbal communication and interaction, but also measured critically against normative standards of reasonableness. If pragmatics is taken to be the study of communicative and interactive language use, as it's customary among discourse analysts, then the need for acting, for uniting empirical description and critical normativity can be acknowledged by construing the study of argumentation as a branch of normative pragmatics. In normative pragmatics, argumentation scholars must make it their business to clarify how the gap between the normative dimension and the descriptive dimension of argumentation can be bridged, so that critical and empirical insights can be systematically integrated. The complex problem problems, I should say, that are at stake can only be solved with the help of a comprehensive research program consisting of various interrelated components. On the one hand, in the philosophical component of the program, the philosophy of reasonableness must be developed and, starting from this ideal of reasonableness, in the theoretical components, a model is to be designed for acceptable argumentation. On the other hand, in the empirical components, Argumentative reality must be investigated empirically, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Then, in the analytical component, the normative and the descriptive dimensions must be systematically linked. Finally, in the practical component, the problems must be identified that occur in the various argumentative practices and methods must be developed to solve these problems. As it happens, the conceptions of reasonableness argumentation scholars have developed in the philosophical component of the research program <coughs> diverge from the outset, so that in the theoretical components different outlooks emerge on what is considered to be an acceptable argument. In the pragmatical approach on argumentation I developed with the late Rob Hogendorst, we were strongly influenced by Barton Grubber's formal dialectics and started from a critical conception of reasonableness that replaces so-called justificationism by a critical testing. This critical conception of reasonableness is associated with the critical rationalist philosophy of reasonableness which claims that in a final sense we cannot be certain of anything and takes as its guiding principle the idea of critically testing all claims to acceptability. As Albert has emphasized, the critical rationalist conception of reasonableness is all embracing. It pertains to any subject that can be the object of a regulated discussion and covers the discussion of descriptive as well as evaluative and practical standpoints. In combining pragmatic and dialectic insights, we pragmatic rely on four meta-theoretical principles which serve as our methodological starting points. Functionalization, socialization, externalization, and dialectification. Functionalization is achieved 
by making use of the fact that argumentative discourse occurs through and in response to speech act performances. Identifying the complex speech act of argumentation and the other speech acts involved in resolving differences of opinion makes it possible to specify the relevant identity conditions and correctness conditions of these speech acts. In this way, for instance, a specification can be given of what is at stake in advancing a certain standpoint, so that it becomes clear how the argumentative discourse is organized around this context of disagreement. Socialization is achieved by identifying who exactly take on the discussion roles of protagonists and antagonists in the collaborative context of argumentative discourse. By extending the speech act perspective to the level of interaction, it can be shown in which ways positions and argumentation in support of positions can be developed and are developed. Externalization is achieved by identifying the specific commitments that are created by the speech acts performed in a context of argumentative interaction. Rather than being treated as internal states of mind, in the speech act perspective, notions such as notions such as disagreement and acceptance can be defined in terms of discursive activities. Acceptance, for instance, can be externalized as giving a preferred response to an arguable act. Finally, dialectification is achieved by regimenting the exchange of speech acts aimed at resolving a difference of opinion and the merits in an ideal model of critical discussion. Implementing the critical rationalist view in the theoretical components of the research program means pursuing the development of a model of critical discussion that gives substance to the idea of resolving differences of opinion on the merits by means of dialectically regulated critical exchanges. In a critical discussion, the protagonist and the antagonist try to make out whether the protagonist's standpoint can be defended in a way that withstands the antagonist's criticism and the outcome of the discussion depends fully on the adequacy of the protagonist's responses to the antagonist's critical questions. The interaction that takes place between the speech act performed by the protagonist to defend the standpoint and those performed by the antagonist to respond critically is characteristic of a pragmatical resolution process. The interaction between the protagonist and the antagonist's speech acts can only lead in a reasonable way to a resolution of the difference of opinion at issue if the discussion is properly regulated. The rules for critical discussion must specify for the various discussion stages in which case the performance of certain speech acts contributes to the resolution of a difference of opinion on the merits. Kalkbrus and I opted for developing a model of critical discussion that is an analytic model. Although our model is therefore not a reproduction of the perspective of an ordinary arguer, where this is appropriate, it nevertheless makes use of, or as some say, is informed by interpretive insights stemming from our emic perspective as arguers. Cutting across the well-known distinction between an interpretive and an analytic model is the perhaps less well-known distinction between an a priori and an a posteriori model. Our model of critical discussion is a priori in the sense that it provides a description of what argumentative discourse would be like if it were ideally tailored to the task of resolving a difference of opinion. At the same time, the model could not have been developed with our certain understanding of the cause and organization of argumentative discourse that is based on experience. In reconstructing argumentative discourse, my co-authors and I have argued for a model that is not only analytic and a priori, but also rational because such a model is, in our view, the most suitable model for covering argumentative discourse and it can subsume and explain much of what is wanted from a conventional model or a sequential model. In our view, an integration of conventional Surlian insight into the communicative aspect of argumentative discourse and rational Russian insights into its interactional aspects provides the most adequate basis for developing a model for dealing with argumentation because it brings together in a pragmatic framework the rules and regularities of actual discourse and the normative principles of goal-directed discourse. The model of critical discussion that Kautenberg and I developed in the 1970s provides an overview of the argumentative moves that are pertinent 
to a constructive development of each of the discussion stages that are to be distinguished in a critical discussion, i.e. to the development that furthers the process of resolving a difference of opinion on the merits in each particular stage. In our model, the critical norms of reasonableness authorizing the performance of speech acts in the various stages of critical discussion are accounted for in a set of dialectical rules. In a critical discussion, the protagonist and the antagonist of the standpoint at issue must observe in every stage all the rules that are instrumental in resolving a difference of opinion. The rules for critical discussion are all the norms, state all the norms that are pertinent to resolving a difference of opinion on the merits and cover the entire argumentative discourse. Each of the rules constitutes a distinct standard or norm for critical discussion. And though the consequences of violating the rules may vary, every violation of a rule in whatever discussion stage it has been committed and by whatever party, whatever party, is a discussion move that obstructs or hinders the resolution of the difference of opinion on the merits and must therefore be regarded as fallacious in this particular sense. Thus, the use of the term fallacy in pragmatic dialectics is systematically connected with the rules for critical discussion. And fallacies may range from preventing each other from expressing any position one wishes to assume in the confrontation stage to unduly generalizing the result of the discussion in the concluding stage. More recently, the late Peter Hafflosser and I have explained that the analytic and evaluative power of the practical theoretical framework can be enhanced considerably by systematically integrated insights from rhetoric. We argued that in conducting argumentative discourse, while trying to realize the dialectical aspiration of resolving a difference of opinion in accordance with the standards pertaining to critical discussion, the arguers may be regarded to make at the same time a rhetorical attempt to have things their way. Viewed pragmatically in every stage of the resolution process, the parties that may be presumed to hold to the dialectical objective of the discussion stage concerned may be regarded to be simultaneously out for the optimal rhetorical result of that stage. Thus, the dialectical objectives of each of the four stages of the resolution process may be taken to have their rhetorical analogs. To reconcile the concurrent pursuit of these rhetorical and dialectical aims, the arguers make use of what Havlasser and I have coined strategic <coughs> maneuvering. Strategic maneuvering, which is aimed at maintaining the balance between these two endeavors. Harkloss and I make an analytic distinction between three basic aspects of or dimensions of strategic maneuvering. First, there is making an expedient selection from the topical potential, that is, choosing from the options that are open in a certain discussion stage. In the confrontation stage, for instance, the standpoint will be chosen by the party that seems most suitable for this party to handle. In the opening stage, the premises that can be helpful starting points of the discussion to the party concerned. In the argumentation stage, the reasons that are most appropriate for the party for defending the standpoint. And in the concluding stage, the best possible outcome for this party among the alternatives. Second, there is framing one's contribution in accordance with audience demand. That is, adapting one's moves in each of the four stages to the specific expectations and preferences of the listeners or readers. Third, there is using the most effective presentational devices. That is, exploiting the available means of conveying messages from the stylistic repertoire. Although, contrary to what some also seem to think, the realization of rhetorical aims can go well together with the pursuit of dialectical objectives, this does not mean that in strategic maneuvering there is always a perfect balance. Perfect balance between pursuing the two goals. If parties allow their commitments to a critical exchange of argumentative moves to be overruled by their persuasive aims, so that their moves are no longer in agreement with the critical norms of the pragmatic dialectical rules, we say that their strategic maneuvering gets derailed. The criteria for determining whether an argumentative move involves a derailment of strategic maneuvering because a rule for critical discussion has been violated 
may vary according to the argumentative activity type in which the maneuvering takes place. Because by convention, each argumentative activity type has to some extent its own preconditions for legitimate strategic maneuvering. The criteria for making a legitimate appeal to authority, for instance, will be different in a legal case from the criteria pertaining to a political debate. Analyzing argumentative discourse pragmatically amounts to interpreting the discourse and the strategic moves made in the discourse systematically from the theoretical perspective of a critical discussion. Described earlier. Such an analysis is pragmatic in viewing the discourse as essentially an exchange of speech acts in context and dialectical in viewing this exchange as a methodical attempt to resolve a difference of opinion on the merits. By pointing out which speech acts are relevant in the various stages of the, of the resolution process, the model of a critical discussion has the heuristic function of indicating which speech acts need to be considered in the analysis. For various reasons, argumentative reality seldom resembles the ideal of a critical discussion. According to the model, for example, the confrontations, in the confrontation stage, the antagonist of a standpoint must state his doubt or doubt clearly and unambiguously. But in practice, doing so can be face threatening for both parties, so that the discussions have to operate circumspectly. In order to be able to give a sound evaluation, a reconstruction of the discourse is needed that results in an analytic overview of those and only those elements that are potentially relevant to the resolution of a difference of opinion. The analytic overview recapitulates, I would say, the difference of opinion at issue at the confrontation stage and the positions of the participants. It identifies the procedural and substantive premises presented in the opening stage that serve as the starting point of the discussion. It surveys the arguments and criticisms that are explicitly or implicitly advanced, the argument schemes that are used, and the argumentation structures that are developed in the argumentation stage. And it determines the outcome that is reached in the conclusion stage. The concepts referred to in the analytic overview, such as type of difference of opinion, unexpressed premise, argument scheme, and argumentation structure are all defined from the perspective of a critical discussion. <coughs> the reconstruction that takes place in the analysis amounts to making explicit all elements that remain implicit in the actual discourse but are relevant to the resolution process. Reformulating in an unequivocal way those speech acts whose function would otherwise be opaque. Rearranging in a more insightful way speech acts whose order does not reflect that function in the resolution process. And leaving out of consideration all speech acts that do not play a part. Because in actual argumentative discourse, a great many speech acts are performed implicitly or indirectly, a constructive role in conducting a critical discussion can be fulfilled by a great many speech acts that are not explicitly presented as belonging to the categories of speech acts including in a model of a critical discussion, so that they need to be reconstructed first. In reconstructing argumentative discourse, we emphasize that it is crucial that the transformations carried out in the reconstruction are indeed justified. They must be faithful to the commitments that may be ascribed to the participants on the basis of their contributions to the discourse. In order not to overinterpret what seems implicit in the discourse, the analyst must be sensitive to the rules of language use, the details of the presentation, and the constraints inherent in the micro context of the argumentative situation and the macro context of the argumentative activity type in which the discourse takes place. To go beyond the naive reading of the discourse, Empirical insight concerning the way in which oral and written discourse are conducted, including the way in which strategic maneuvering develops, is to be used to augment the analyst's intuitions with the help of the results of empirical research, both qualitative and quantitative. Only then the reconstruction can lead to an analytic overview that is a sound basis for carrying out an evaluation in which any fallacies committed in the discourse can be fairly displayed. 
Okay, to illustrate the pragmatical method of analysis, I shall give a brief analysis of an advertorial that appeared in a great many American magazines at the time when in the United States public attitudes towards smoking had started to shift dramatically. Part of a call for congressional hearings to consider further restrictions on the advertising of cigarettes was the argument that tobacco companies were advertising to children to replace the growing number of adult smokers who were quitting or dying. Among the responses issued by R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company was the following advertorial. It's on your handout. Some surprising advice to young people from R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. Don't smoke. For one thing, smoking has always been an adult custom. And even for adults, smoking has become very controversial. So even though we are a tobacco company, we don't think it's a good idea for young people to smoke. Now we know that giving this kind of advice to young people can sometimes backfire. But if you take up smoking just to prove you are an adult, you're really proving just the opposite. Because deciding to smoke or not to smoke is something you should do when you don't have anything to prove. Think it over. After all, you may not be old enough to smoke, but you're old enough to think. Although an advertorial is an activity type that is, in spite of having the form of an editorial, an advertisement with a commercial rationale, it is not supposed to contain assertions that are not true. And any argumentation that is used in the advertorial may be seen as a serious attempt to defend the standpoint. It is against the background of these institutional constraints that we are going to analyze the case made by R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. For the sake of brevity, we shall focus in the first place on the strategic maneuvering with topical selection in the argumentation stage. Since it belongs to Reynolds' dialectical commitments to make a real effort at convincing young people that they should not smoke, whereas Reynolds, being a tobacco company, cannot be expected to abandon altogether its rhetorical aim of persuading people to smoke. It may be assumed that some sophisticated strategic maneuvering is going on. The question is how the various moves are selected, adapted to the audience, and fashioned in such a way that the colliding dialectical and rhetorical aims are more or less reconciled. After the announcement preceding the text has created the surprising perspective desired by Reynolds, the text begins with the pronouncement, don't smoke. This pronouncement initiates the confrontation stage by expressing, by way of a rather paternalistic advice, the normative standpoint that Reynolds, viewed dialectically, is expected to defend in the text. Although Reynolds is aware that young people are usually not inclined to accept this kind of paternalistic advice, they put it bluntly in the strongest possible terms, thus accepting the considerable risk that, exactly because of this presentation, their advice will be resisted. There are indeed arguments advanced to support the standpoint presented, so that the argumentation stage uh, one might view dialectically expect to follow is indeed on. But it's already clear from the start that there is something odd about these arguments. The wording of the arguments is also chosen in a strange way. That smoking is controversial implies that there are valid reasons for not smoking, but also that there are valid reasons to smoke. In other words, that the opinions on this matter are literally divided. The reconstruction of the structure of the organization put forward by Reynolds in defense of their standpoint looks like you see on your handout on the two. Standpoint is young people should not smoke, and the important argumentation is because smoking has always uh, been an adult custom, and even for adults it has become controversial. What observations can be made? Concerning the topical choice made in this strategic maneuvering in favor of the standpoint that young people should not smoke. Paradoxically, it's already clear from the start that the arguments that are advanced will not appeal to young people. It's more than doubtful, to say the least, whether considerations of convention and age will be decisive reasons for young people to decide not to smoke. It's more likely that to the average young person, the conventional presupposition that smoking is the privilege of adults 
will be an occasion to go against that. And that smoking has become controversial will make it only more interesting to the young. An even more striking property of Reynolds' topical choice is that they leave conspicuously unmentioned the readily available arguments that smoking can become an addiction and cause cancer, which are much more obvious and much stronger arguments. The reason for not mentioning these arguments will be clear. If the firm would commit itself to them, this would leave Reynolds with an awkward dialectical inconsistency. The health arguments would strongly undermine the credibility of the standpoint that adults should be allowed to smoke. This standpoint may not be expressed in the texts, but as the tobacco company Reynolds is of course committed to it. The arguments advanced for the standpoint that young people should not smoke seem in a perverse way selected for their incapacity to contribute to the defense of the official standpoint that young people should not smoke. By advancing arguments that so evidently do not support the disputed standpoint satisfactorily, Reynolds evokes the top loss, if there are only bad reasons for not doing something, then there are no good reasons for not doing it. The reasoning towards the desired conclusion suggested to the young readers can be reconstructed in the following way. And the unexpressed steps are put in parentheses and it's under three on your handout. So there's the unexpressed uh, uh, standpoint in this case. There are no good reasons for young people not to smoke because smoking has always been an adult custom and even for adults smoking has become controversial. These are the only reasons why young people should not smoke. They are bad reasons and if there are only bad reasons for refraining from doing something then there are no good reasons for not doing it. It's evident that Reynolds intends to convey standpoint one, that there are no good reasons for young people not to smoke, through implication, without committing themselves to this standpoint. It has become clear that it can be left to the young readers to draw this conclusion for themselves. After having thus argued, you could say, why young people should not smoke, viewed analytically, Reynolds returns to the opening stage of the discussion to acknowledge a concession concession is, we know that giving this kind of advice to young people can sometimes backfire. On the face of it, this acknowledgement is followed by a move aimed at preventing the dreaded effect from occurring. Quote, but if you take up smoking just to prove you are an adult, you are really proving just the opposite. On closer inspection, however, a different effect must be aimed for, because it's obvious in advance that this warning will not be very effective. Although Reynolds may suggest that young people who take up smoking only do so to prove that they are adults, strictly speaking, they say that those who take up smoking only to prove that they are adults prove exactly the opposite. In other words, there is no problem when you take up smoking for some other reason, let's say because you happen to like smoking. In that case, you do not prove that you are not an adult. The addition of just even allows for taking up smoking to prove that you are an adult as long as you do have other reasons for smoking as well. In some, you are almost always in the right. In the concluding stage of this argumentative activity type of an advisory uh, advertorial, it would be normal and pertinent in light of current discussion to repeat the advice not to smoke. So once more we emphatically urge you not to smoke or something like that. Instead, Reynolds advises their young readers to reconsider, reconsider the matter, while deliberately avoiding to state a conclusion that should be obvious. The advertorial ends, in fact, with a contradictory statement. Although the young readers are advised to think about it, first, the phrasing, you may not be old enough to smoke, but you're old enough to think, suggests that it is already clear to them that they should not smoke. What is there left to think about if they have already accepted that they are too young to smoke? In the analysis of the strategic maneuvering taking place in the editorial, we concentrate on topical selection rather than audience adaptation and exploiting stylistic devices. Taking also these other aspects into account can strengthen the analysis still further. Remember, as a case in point, the presentational choice of the word controversial, when Reynolds stated that smoking has become very controversial, even for adults, thus suggesting that, that the matter is, in fact, still undecided, and that there is something to be said both for the positive and the negative view of smoking, so that smoking might, after all, well be acceptable. 
It is, in other ways, R.J. Reynolds, to bankrupt companies' tax, is pervaded with sly efforts to get young people to reject rather than accept Reynolds' case. Now, my concluding evaluation. Our partial analysis of the Reynolds tobacco editorial shows that at every stage of the implicit discussion they are having with their readers, Reynolds maneuvers strategically. On the one hand, they make an effort to comply publicly with their formal commitment to keep young people from smoking, while on the other hand, they try to serve at the same time their business mission of protecting the commercial interests of the firm. Although Reynolds Tobacco do their utmost to maintain in all discussion stages the image that their position is consistent, the analysis makes clear that in fact their efforts are indirectly in the first place directed towards undermining their official standpoint that young people should not smoke. Therefore, in this specific case, the strategic maneuvering cannot conceal that here the arguer's rhetorical aim prevails. Viewed from an evaluative perspective, my analysis has made plausible that in this editorial, Reynolds followed a strategy that is aimed at rendering their official argumentation counterproductive. Of course, a well-balanced evaluation of the discourse is possible only after the analysis has been fully completed. All the same, the partial analysis I have provided already enables us to observe that Reynolds, because they advance arguments that are from the outset unlikely to convince, violates in a special way the pragmatic dialectical relevance rule for critical discussion, which states that standpoints may not be defended by non-argumentation or by argumentation that is not relevant to the standpoint. This makes Reynolds Tobacco Company guilty of committing a strategic variant of the relevance fallacy of ignoratio elenchi. In this way, I have shown that the dialectical reconstruction in which the rhetorical dimension of argumentative discourse is systematically taken into account, provides useful insight into strategic maneuvering carried out in argumentative discourse to reconcile rhetorical aims with dialectical commitments. In a critical evaluation, some specimens of this strategic maneuvering will stand up as acceptable, while other cases involve a violation of one or more of the rules for critical discussion. My analysis of Reynolds' advertorials shows that it, this is, in this text there is no lack of such violations. Thus, the Reynolds example illustrates that rhetorically smart strategic maneuvering will not lead to an acceptable strategy if it's not at the same time directly justified. In addition, the Reynolds case not only illustrates that the pragmatic dialectical analysis and evaluation become more pertinent and more powerful when rhetorical insight is incorporated, but also that the rhetorical analysis of argumentative discourse is made much more meaningful when the analysis takes place in the dialectical framework that defines the range of reasonableness and sets limits to the strategic maneuvering that is allowed. To conclude, I venture to claim that the pragmatic dialectical method of analysis and evaluation opens up the possibility for an enlightening reconstruction and a critical assessment of the strategic maneuvering conducted in all argumentative activity types in which argumentative discourse plays a crucial part. Thank you very much.